Thank you. So um, I wanted to introduce everyone. So welcome our audience to the first day of the Real Truth About Health Conference and to our first panel. Um, this panel is about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And I'd like if each of you would just tell us who you are and what your most recent book was and just a one minute summary of what you've been doing the last 20 years. So everyone could just connect with you just for a minute before we start the questions. Uh, you gonna, what do you, what sure. do you want to start? I, you could start, Dr. Bredesen. Okay, sure. Yeah. So my name is Dale Bredesen uh, and I've been interested for my whole career in mechanisms of neurodegeneration. We spent 30 years in the lab looking at what drives the neurodegenerative process. And then in the last 10 years, we've been trying to translate this into effective strategies. And my most recent book uh, is called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. Uh, we published a trial uh, with improvement in cognition just last year, and we're starting our next larger trial, randomized controlled trial, in just a couple of months. Steve? Okay, I can go next if you like. Um, I'm not sure. Am I up? Sure, yes. Okay. Um, my name is Steve Blake, and uh, my most recent book, well, <laughs> I have quite a few of them, but uh, relevant to this is Nutrients for Memory and Parkinson's disease, dietary regulation of dopamine. And I uh, work at the Maui Memory Clinic and also work extensively publishing uh, with various places from <clears throat> Macmillan to McGraw-Hill and also scholarly papers. And I look forward to helping people who are attending this talk understand some more about what they can do to help reduce the risk of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Ray Dorsey. I'm a neurologist at the University of Rochester. Delighted to be part of this distinguished panel and be part of this uh, conference. Uh, my colleagues and I wrote this book called Ending uh, Parkinson's Disease, which is the world's fastest growing brain disease. My passion is that I think much of this uh, Parkinson's is preventable and I'd like us to uh, create a world where Parkinson's disease is again rare and not common. Okay, so thank you all. And this topic is a little bit sensitive to me as a close person in my life. I'm in their 50s, got early onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So I am familiar with uh, some of the issues related to having this, this health challenge. Um, so for the, this is our ninth year doing the Real Truth About Health Conference. And a lot of us many years ago got very excited when Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn said that you can be heart attack proof. And a lot of us found that diet and lifestyle could offer tremendous hope when it comes to obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. <clears throat> but it's always been understood that when we talked about lifestyle medicine, we don't want to mention certain diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's because it was pretty much understood that this was rough. There wasn't a lot to be positive about, and no one was really standing up and saying that you should have a lot of hope. And when we asked people, um, everyone was a little bit uncomfortable making it saying anything too positive. Um, and then uh, I met Steve Blake and he spoke and he was very encouraging and said he's actually seen real progress. And when I spoke to him, <clears throat> I was surprised. It seemed like he wasn't just saying it, he really believed it. And I was really interested and encouraged by that. Um, and then recently when I read Dr. <laughs> Bredesen's book, um, I was again surprised. I really originally read the book with the thinking that you know, this is, I don't know, maybe going to be some positive thinking because I had already decided that Alzheimer's was sort of hope, hopeless a little bit. And this was the most encouraging book by far I've ever read on it. And I really came away feeling like, wow, this is really a lot you can do, a real lot you could do. And I became very excited that Alzheimer's was now part of the discussion. And um, as he continued to write more about it, and wrote, a, wrote case histories about people who've recovered, I realized he was really onto something. He was one of the world's authorities on this topic. He's been doing all the research and he was not just saying maybe, he was saying that yes, um, this, was, this was a real thing that we could make a difference in a big way with Alzheimer's. Um, now Parkinson's, I also considered maybe even more hopeless than Alzheimer's because I've never heard anyone say anything good and when I read Dr. Dorsey's book, again, um, it was a little bit of a surprising book because there was, you know, it was so, it was very clear that our lifestyle 
And our modern world is a significant cause, if not the major cause of Parkinson's. So we're not really just having this panel to give you a pep talk. I'm saying that there was tremendous information in these books that I'm very excited to share with everyone um, to help everyone uh, be more hopeful and more aware of the latest information. So um, Dr. Bredesen's only gonna be here for the first hour. So we'll maybe focus a little more on Alzheimer's at the beginning, um, but all these questions are meant for uh, anyone, whether you wanna talk about Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, we'll try to keep the answers short um, or short, not you know, like to three or four minutes so that we can get through a lot of questions. So I am gonna start with the questions. So here we go. Um, first, um, Dr. Bredesen, you made a big, big point of saying you had this thing called, you named it Ketoflex 12-3. What, what were the two, what was this about? Um, what, please tell us about this. Sure. So let me just start by saying, uh, really enthusiastic to be here uh, with this uh, August group here. And, you know, people who are actually trying to make a difference, there's unfortunately so much of kind of the sticking with the 20th century approach to these diseases. And I think you mentioned lifestyle. It's important to point out, this is not just about lifestyle. This is about fundamental change in the way we interact with patients, going from a situation where we write a single prescription for somebody who's got a very complex illness and that the prescription has nothing to do with why they got the illness, to now in the, in the 21st century, looking at networks, changing in brain networks, whether it's motor modulation as in Parkinson's, whether it's neuroplasticity as in Alzheimer's or other things, and identifying all the critical components in that network and then going after those. And you're absolutely right. Lifestyle is part of it. And so we developed, we're just asked, you know, biochemically, what do you need? And I know Dr. Blake is a real expert in this area. So biochemically, what do you need? to optimize your plasticity. And I talked a little bit about this this morning. So you need to have a reduction in inflammation if you've got ongoing inflammation. You've got to have a reduction in ongoing exposure to toxins. You've got to have support for optimal energetics. And that means blood flow and oxygenation and mitochondrial function and actually ketones and glucose, which are the two things your brain is trying to burn. And it means to optimize your trophic support, and that's NGF, BDNF, hormones, nutrients. So again, this is a network. So Ketoflex 12.3 is the name we gave to the diet, but there are lots of good diets. What you want to do is you want to have something that gives you high phytonutrients, things like polyphenols and things that have, that gives you a, uh, a high fiber intake. That's great for your glycemic load. That's great for your lipid status. That's great for your detox and so forth and so on. And of course, it's great for your microbiome. You want to have something that gives you appropriate fasting that makes you metabolically flexible so that you can burn both. Most people with Alzheimer's can't burn either. They're, they're insulin resistant and they're not keto adapted. So they are really having an energy problem. And we call it keto flex because we're, we're trying to drive these people into mild ketosis as Professor Stephen Kinane has shown. Although you have this reduction in glucose utilization in the temporal and parietal lobes, you can still utilize ketones. And he's shown just giving ketones alone is helpful. So we're trying to drive people into ketosis and we're telling them you should have a period of fasting. Now you have to be careful. Alzheimer's disease is fundamentally an insufficiency in that network, but it is born of excess. So in other words, too much sugar, too much exposure to these various toxins and things are what's driving. So you don't wanna to get too much into starving yourself, but you wanna become metabolically flexible. And so 12 hours minimum fast at night, three hours minimum fast before bed. You don't want your insulin to be spiking there. And so that's what we call a keto flex 12 free for that reason. And again, diet is a critical part of the overall addressing of the abnormalities that ultimately lead to Alzheimer's disease. Okay, a lot of good points there. I'm not sure how to raise my hand here. I'll go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, well, good points uh, all the way, Dr. Bredesen. Uh, I will say that uh, ketogenesis let me start with the source of why the brain cells are not getting the glucose in there. Uh, the problem is not that the brain cells can't burn the glucose. The problem is that brain cells can't get the glucose inside the brain cells. 
Normally sure. this is triggered by insulin and the insulin is going to trigger the insulin substrate receptor, which triggers phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase and then protein kinase B. And then finally, the glucose transporter pulls glucose into the brain cell. The reason why all of this doesn't work is because we have too much dietary saturated fat that makes it so we have up to half of the insulin receptors to begin with and interferes, as I believe Dr. Bredesen has, has pointed out prior talk, interferes with the substrate receptor of the insulin that, that docks onto the, the beta end, the internal end of the insulin receptor. So we've really got a lot of problems with getting glucose into the brain, but we can reverse insulin resistance by lowering saturated fats. If this is the case, then we can get glucose to those brain cells and quickly. We're talking about weeks, not a long time. Once this is the case, <laughs> excuse me, then it's really exciting because the brain then can utilize its preferred fuel, which is glucose. Yeah, and, and I should point out also, of course, there's some uh, beautiful work from years ago <laughs> showing that, in fact, the amyloid beta itself, one of its many, many effects is to block the insulin receptor itself. So it actually impairs insulin signaling. So there are you know, multiple effects, as you say. And again, I think with a lot of these things in medicine, there's no perfect, you know, right, wrong answer. If we can get that, if we can get that energetic approach going, that's helpful. Now, is the, you know, is the only way to do it to reduce saturated fat? I don't think so, because I think that you can also add ketones. Again, Professor Kunane has done this very effectively, has published data, has shown improvements in mild cognitive impairment. Just taking someone who has MCI and just adding exogenous ketones. So I think there are, you know, there are multiple ways to address the deficiencies. But I agree with you that fundamentally, this is a network insufficiency that you're trying to address. The energetics, as you say, um, the cells, and you can certainly see that on a PET scan, the cells aren't utilizing glucose as they should. And of course, the cells can't get their glucose not only because of insulin resistance, but because of problems with blood flow to the brain cells. Absolutely. It's also uh, an artifact of eating too much saturated fat and too little of those anti-inflammatory plant foods that you were just talking about. Yeah, so and of we, course- we have a combination of factors. I do wanna also mention though that 12 hours is normal for a liver to produce glucose sufficient to run our brains every night. And that ketosis is unlikely to be achieved in 12 hours. Usually it takes days of fasting to deplete the liver and de novo glucogenesis to really stop. So for these reasons, I would really like to see people getting their insulin resistance down. And of course, it's not just a problem for the brain. It's problems throughout the body. Right. And once you know, we're going to talk about advanced glycation end products and glycated hemoglobin. And that also is a problem with insulin resistance and also can be reversed by getting down to a reasonable intake of saturated fats. Absolutely. I think it's a really good point. I mean, depending on you know, what you're looking for, uh, you know, as Walter Longo has, has shown, it takes a few days before you're actually getting stem cell effects uh, from, you know, from fasting. So there, you're right. There are different times and we typically recommend 12 to 14 hours for APOE4 negative and 14 to 16 hours or even more for people who are APOE4 positive. But you're absolutely right. This is for someone who's been doing this repeatedly. When you start de novo, you, you know, you're, you're dealing with glycogen storage that may, you know, maybe 12 hours, maybe 24 hours, you know, it depends on what your status is. Yes, and that same glycogen storage is interfered with. Once you finally get that glucose into the, the cell, what, any cell in the body, then it needs to be put into glycogen storage, which is, for, for people who aren't familiar with it, thousands of glucose molecules stored as glycogen for an energy reserve, say in muscle cells. So you don't yeah. really need glucose right away when you start running. You've got to, and your brain cells do it too. So, but that is interfered with again by palmitate and other saturated fatty acids that interfere with the storage of glycogen. So interfere with our brain's reserve of glucose. Yeah, and so, you know, I think all these things need to be internally consistent. So, so I guess my question would be, you have someone, Professor Kinane, for example, who's just giving saturated fat. He's given MCT to people who already have MCI. From what I'm understanding from you, they shouldn't be getting better, but he's showing that they do. 
So how does that work when giving a saturated fat to a situation when saturated fat is not supposed to be helpful? It's, it is because just what you said is the brain can burn hydroxybutyrate and acetone. These are the ketones that the brain is burning. Acetone, you remember that, the solvent that was outlawed because it was sure. too toxic. Acetone is a ketone. And the brain can burn that, but it's not a preferred fuel. What happens is, yes, at first, now MCI has several meanings. If you're talking about coconut oil, which is 65% of lauric myristic and palmitic acid, then that's gonna increase the problems of getting glucose into the blood cells. So there may be a temporary ability of the brain cells to utilize the ketones, but with a long-term degradation, by increased insulin resistance and lack of ability to intake and utilize glucose. So the long-term effects are very, very bad, even though temporarily a few ketones might get utilized. And remember, the brain loves glucose. Ketones are a, a secondary source that they're not desired. So my approach would be the safer one reduce insulin resistance, get those brain cells back up and going. And as you mentioned, there are many other approaches that can happen simultaneously to get those brain cells protected. And of course, we want to keep them alive because if they die, then it's all over. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. I'm, I'm, MCT that he used was caprylic acid. <laughs>